thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah, today is about looking at side channels from a little different angle, not from the oscilloscope, more from the motion sensors, which we all have in our pockets. This is how it looks in Singapore. When you are in the MRT, many, many people with smartphones and they're all in there. But if you take a closer look inside, you suddenly see, well, they have some sensors equipped and I think we all know that. The problem there is that these sensors, um, some of them are accessible without permission. So you come to my website and I ask, may I have your accelerometer data? May I have your gyroscope data? The smartphone provides it to me, especially at a really high frequency. Even better if I have a if I have an application which I maliciously installed or is behind another app. So the idea was, well, if we can ask for that information, which is granted by the sensors, train it to some specific movements of the smartphone or to some specific characteristics, then these are features which could provide information about some private information. So, for example, if you are on a bicycle, it's a specific movement in your pocket. If you go up the stairs, it's another one. So you can classify that. So, what we then thought to have a big effect, what is the one movement which is really small and pr has and requires a higher frequency as well? So. This is the password. So if you have your smartphone and you type in your password, like 1111, you move your phone a little different than if you would type 9999. So each key has a specific movement while your smartphone is, is being entered the pin in. So the scenario here is if you have, an, if you have a malicious application, you can train these movements of a specific user, like install some brain jogging and he has to solve some super, super critical math problems like what is two plus two and you have to answer that in one second. So he enters four really fast and you get that movement which he normally does at his pin. Then measure that same movement when he enters his actual pin. So you are then able to reconstruct that movement to that specific digit he just entered, thus reconstructing the password and unfortunately unlocking the smartphone. So to put that into practice, we said, okay, we have three participants, three candidates who entered who enter pins. And we have two smartphones to to get some non biased uh research here. Still maybe some, but we tried our best. Um, yeah, so we had um, one smartphone which represents the average, Nexus 5, and one which was more advanced, an S7 of Samsung. So each candidate put in many, many passwords, but in specific combinations that you get the whole set. So if you press 1, you have to get all the movements from 1 to 2, 1 to 3, 1 to 4, and so on. And the same with all the other digits. So in your training base, you have a complete set and not, some, not just some specific pins. Second, we measured all sensors during the input with an application we therefore did. So each candidate entered the specific set several times. We saved that data, cut it in digits, more to that on the, on the next slide, and then linked each measurement of a digit to the label of the key. We trained it, we tested, and then received results. What we did differently, however, to all the other papers previously, was we looked at each digit individually. So what others did was some said, OK, we have a password 0852. This is what it looks like if you enter it. And then they did it for maybe 50 combinations, entered them multiple times, tested on the training data, and these were the results. You can do better. So we thought, why not, why not look at each key individually, cut it, which is quite good visible, 
and then you just have 10 classes left, which are 0 to 9, and not 10,000 classes if you look at the whole pin. But you are still able to classify 10,000 combinations for a uh, four-digit pin as you just look at each digit individually. So with that idea in mind, we made about 500 recordings. So we ended up with 2,500 individual measurements of a digit. And then we said, OK, let's look at the results. And these are all results after 20 guesses of our classification system. So to retrieve the success rate for the accelerometer, which was I can classify, I, I can classify a, a pin with four digits with 65% or something after 20 guesses, just by using the accelerometer data. So we just trained with it and tested. For testing, we are, are of course did a validation set, which was not included in the training data, and did that for each sensor, and then permutated all sensors together to get the information which worked the best, which were accelerometer and the gyroscope, as they were the ones who didn't interfere much with each other. Because if you take, for example, the rotation vector sensor, which he uses as the, he uses the sources of the accelerometer and the gyroscope and then aggregates it to recreate how you specifically move your phone. And if you just look at these two, di two dimensions of movement of your phone and then movement from the phone itself around itself, you get information which is not interfering with each other, thus making the network the most stable. Yeah, talking about network, this was the best algorithm as well. So we used different types. One was the random forest, the Gaussian naive base, the, of course, random guessing, <laughs> which was, yeah, it's always a 10 after 20 guesses. And um, yeah, neural network performed best at the beginning, quite similar to the random forest, but the more data fed, the better it became. Um, what we did there is we thought we had two middle layers. The first one, so we had 36 features. The first layer was as big as the input layer, and the second layer was as big at the, as the output layer, which were 10, 10 classes. So we have 10 neurons at the third and 36 at the second. So we first get one more layer to receive more information and then pull it down to 10 and pass it on to the output layer. But more well, we can do more of that in the questions then. Then we thought, okay, if we cut that specific digit at two specific points, what if we cut it a little before? What if we cut it a little after? Is there any information if I move my finger from one to nine or from two to nine? Is there any information there or is it just adding noise to it? So we added 50 milliseconds at the front and 50 milliseconds at the back and ended up at 75%, but our best was with the combination of 50 milliseconds at the front and zero at the, at the, at the end. So we enlarged the cut digit, ended up with 83%, which means you can unlock a phone with 83% of the 20 guesses and with around 30-ish after three guesses. Then we thought, okay, enough theory, let's make it practical. So if you would think about adding more candidates to your training base, you have 10,000, for example, so you 10,000 candidates, then you, have, then you can maybe forget, then maybe you don't have to include your, your target. But before that, we said, First, let's see if there is adhering information from other candidates, which increases the result from the specific one you are testing. So if the candidate you want to classify is in the training set, as well as other candidates as well, results became better. Then we said, OK, if we now remove that one candidate out of the training set and still have some probability or still have some success in classifying the password we can show we can show the we can show a viable 
or we can show a proof of concept that if you scale that amount of candidates in your training set, you are actually able to classify a pin without training specifically the classification algorithm to your target. If we look a little wider, we have further applications. One is the behavioral application. So you make a so you make a daily cycle. When does somebody sleep? WhatsApp is enough, by the way. If, if you have a telephone number of your friend, you always know when he's online. He can't he can't make it stop. You see when he's online. So if you just look at that, you already know the information when he's sleeping or not. If you look at it over several days, over several months, you know what's the time he goes to bed at which day. And these are these tiny little informations which are public right now, which are not aware of causing some critical leak of private information. So another one is the network signal, which is accessible freely. If you move around the city, drive in your car, then you can classify the network signal over time, which is changing by your movement. So you have specific patterns. So you don't have to ask the permission, may I use your GPS signal? You can use that. Or, as we showed with pins, we, can, we know where someone is tapping. The same goes with your health records or your smart watches. Look fancy. However, you can still receive some critical information. So if someone, what do we have here? Allergies, clinical vitals, or maybe, maybe some heartbeat information. And you all, these are always at the same position. So if someone presses here a lot and the app is open, you can know. And the last one, there's a little deeper now if you, if you look at the battery data. So you can ask how much battery is left, how much energy is left on my battery. And you can, you can maximize it to four, four milliseconds per, per, per question. So it's at the kernel level where you ask it. If you, if you could accelerate, so if you could increase that frequency, you can then you can then see when more energy is drained or less. Which means if some private if some if some algorithm is running, and a private key is processed, then the leakage of in, of energy when you are multiplying or if you're taking something to the power of two, or so squaring, it's different. So you can see, well, at a zero, one is multiplying, at a one, one is squaring, and then you can get the private key information out of that. However, the frequencies for at mil for milliseconds are still very high, uh, still very low, to get that granular information. But a colleague of mine is currently working on it, and she's having quite some success with it on the course. So what can we take away with it? On our mobile devices itself, we have more and more capabilities of, of, of computing, while at the same time our sensors become more accurate. So the only thing left to make it a good thing is that the accessibility decreases of all the information, information you can currently receive. So what we could do against it, if we now look at countermeasures, we have four dimensions. We have the developers, we have the OS itself, manufacturers, and of course the consumers. Manufacturers side, I don't know, they can't do much on this one because implementing sensors with the less frequency, they wouldn't make any money. And um, on the OS side, I think there you can do the most. For example, if you disable sensors during sensitive input, let's say your banking account, that's good. However, if you do a daily cycle, so if you measure at a lower frequency when someone's running, when someone's taking the bike, that's still measurable. Which means if you could decrease the frequency a lot and only allow for specific applications of fast frequency, that would solve it. Which would imply, uh, let's say, a fast frequency certificate 
apps have to apply for specifically. And the next one is disabling the background sensor measurement, which means if you are on my website and you close the and you close your browser, I can't measure anymore. Or if you have your phone on standby. So the last one is the consumer side, which is raising higher awareness. Well, we are doing it right now, but maybe just a little more people then. <laughs> but yeah, it, this is, I think, the most critical one, which could be already achieved with if you just ask for more permissions, because then people see, well, I have to, I have to grant a lot of permissions. Maybe the user experience becomes less, but put it in the right way. And maybe that's a that's a way of doing. So that's most from me. Now I'm interested in your questions. Thank you. Oh, questions. Yes. So did you actually? really try doing this for example from a browser and then if somebody types in the pin on the phone yeah that you can see the pin yeah so especially the browser thing because i'm kind of like amazed that that uh, the browser can still get this kind of information mm -hmm. when it's in the background yeah that's we, that's the thing yeah. that's real yeah so okay. we specifically did the application part where we installed the application itself and there were several other publications that did it with the browser version. Yes. Uh, but just to confirm, that's just on Android, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good point. Yeah, we did it on Android. In on iOS, there are others, but I won't make actual answers which can be validated on that one so yes um so um you've mentioned that uh you've tested this on the nexus 5 and galaxy s7 uh, galaxy s7 um do you think those are suitable as as a reference do they kind of represent how um the sensors work on most of, of the other uh, smartphones yeah, that was the basic idea of choosing those two devices because first you try to maximize the effect of 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 the research and if if we take a look at what's the most sold device or most sold device in use and take a look at the technicals these are these are I think making a wide wide range of people and the S7 pushes it a little more to the higher frequency part, which is more suitable to our current time and to the time coming. But again, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I think especially the second part is the the newer the phones become, while the accessibility remains, um, it just gets better. Yeah. So the accessibility has to be decreased. Is there any example code available? Yes. So uh, what what is what is available is the the training set, and uh, we can go deeper into it if you like. All right. And thank you. Thanks, David.